we have seen quantum algorithms in truth we have only seen some uh, basic algorithms which were kind of designed to show separation between quantum and classic they were not natural problems they were made up so that we can show that classical model of computation and quantum model of computation is different let's move on let's look at few algorithms which are for the lack of better term i will call non trivial and solve natural problems these are the problems you might have encountered in a classical computing course or will seem appealing to you the example of this are grover's algorithm and shor's algorithm before we go to these algorithms we need building blocks for these algorithms these are important subroutines which are helpful in making these algorithms and most of the quantum computing especially the algorithm side uses these building blocks again and again what are these two building blocks one is the fourier transform and other is called phase estimation these are two very important subroutines which we want to look at next let's start with fourier transform you might have heard of fourier transform before many of you might have seen it in signal processing some of you might have seen it in number theory definitely has applications in computer science and so on and so forth the basic fourier transform uh takes a function from a real domain to real domain or a complex domain and then represents it in a trigonometric function basis we will take a more general approach and then look at applications which are helpful to us but to look at all this you need to be familiar with group theory i assume that most of you have taken a course in group theory if you have not it will be better to go through some of the basics two possible references are you can look at hernstein it's the standard text on abstract algebra you can look at the second chapter or you can look at norman biggs this is a book on discrete mathematics and the 20th chapter talks about group theory in general you can pick up any standard textbook on group theory and read the first chapter on this that would be enough for our purposes from now on i i will assume that you know basic groups let's start talking about fourier transform what is fourier transform it talks about functions of the kind from a group g is a group for us it will be a finite abelian group if you are not very very familiar with the general group you can take the group to be zn which is the set of numbers modulo n to make your things easy for you if you don't want to think of a general group just feel that you are doing all this 
for the group Zn and that would be enough for further discussion. Later you can think of a generalized group. So we have a function from group to complex numbers. The easiest way to give the description of this function, if I want to say what this function is, easiest way is I say what is fg1, what is fg2, fgn, where n is the size of the group. In other words, I am going to tell you what is the function value at each of these points. This way, if I write it as a big vector, then what I am saying is that the function can be viewed as an element of this vector space. This is the complex vector space with dimension cardinality of g. This is something which we have seen a lot of times. This is the vector which we are talking about. Now we can say what Fourier transform is. Fourier transform is a basis change operator on this vector space for a nice basis. You might ask what do I mean by a nice basis and that is what we are going to do next but this is going to be the definition for Fourier transform. If you already know that this nice basis is going to be the character basis. If you do not, I am going to describe characters next. This is the punchline. What is Fourier transform? It is a basis change operator on c to the power n for the character basis. For those of you who are not familiar with characters, let us talk about characters of a group next. We were talking about functions from a group to complex numbers. Characters are special kind of functions. They are homomorphisms. Formally, chi is a function from g to c excluding 0 such that it respects the group operation. What do I mean by that? It respects the group operation. Chi of g1, g2 is chi of g1 multiplied by chi of g2. This is a very intuitive property to be satisfied by a function. Some people would call it homomorphism. Some people would call that it respects the group operation. But in any case, you can see that such kind of functions are nice. They are behaving well with the internal definition of group. Such functions are called characters. Remember that no element can map to C. Can you think of a character for any group? The easiest one is when I assign every element to be 1 for all the group elements. This is called the trivial character. Thankfully, this is not the only character. There are many others, uh, but they satisfy some small properties. One interesting property is that since this is a finite abelian group, I know that g to the power n is equal to 1 for all g element of the groups. This is, this is a basic property of any group element. This implies that chi of g whole to the power n is equal to 1. So, this implies not just that chi of g is not 0, but it is always a point on the unit circle. 
at the absolute value of chi g is 1. We need to remember that it is a complex number. Not just that, there are many nice properties of characters. Let's look at them one by one and that will also give us some important things which will let us define the Fourier transform. What do we know about characters? We know that if I sum up chi g for all the group elements, this thing is going to be 0. This is almost always true except when chi is a trivial character. It turns out that if chi 1 is a character and chi 2 is a character, this implies even chi, even chi 2 is a character. What do I mean by chi1, chi2? It's the normal multiplication of a function chi1, chi2 of g is chi1 of g multiplied by chi2 of g. And you can easily see that this will give rise to a homomorphism. So chi1, chi2 in itself will be a character. Using 1 and 2, we can get to the main property of characters which, which is very very useful. It says actually that any two characters, let's say chi1 and chi2 are orthogonal. That means summation over g element of g, chi1 g multiplied by chi2 g is 0. Remember we are talking about this subspace, all these characters, all these functions are elements of this vector space, vector space of dimension n. Since these are orthogonal, it will show that number of characters are less than equal to n. It turns out there are exactly n exactly n characters implying that characters form an orthogonal basis or by normalization I can say that it forms an orthonormal basis of C to the G. We promised that Fourier transform was a basis change to a nice basis and now we have seen that if we look at all the characters, they are going to form an orthogonal basis. Let me repeat myself again. This says that Fourier transform is a change of basis to character basis. In some sense, unfortunately, we haven't described what is the standard basis, but that's not hard. If I want to talk about C to the G, what is the standard basis? This is the standard basis. It corresponds to the case when f of G i is equal to Z, uh, 1 and f of G j is equal to 0 for whenever i is not equal to j. This is called or can be called point basis or element wise basis or whatever you want to call. But this is the not this is the standard basis where we can give the function value. The Fourier transform allows us to make a change to the character basis. Not just that these skies are orthogonal, we know something we actually know that the set of characters, we know there are n of them, these form a group. You can talk about inverse of a character, you can multiply them and get a character, this is something which we have seen before 
and this group of characters is denoted by g tilde. It turns out that g tilde is isomorphic to g. But anyway, that is not something we will be using a lot. So, the take home message here is that the characters form an orthogonal basis. This is what we are going to use to define Fourier transform. Knowing this, Fourier transform is pretty easy. f of x is summation i equal to 1 to n. Remember, n is the cardinality of g. Some coefficient multiplied by the ith character. This is the ith character. I have n characters. You can number them as you like. This is the ith character and this is the coefficient. This is called the Fourier coefficient. Of the ith character. This is just a basis change operation. This is saying that since chi i is form an orthonormal basis, we can write any vector in c to the g as a linear combination of chi i's. This is what I am doing. You can see that you can calculate the value of f at i easily. By this, all this discussion, it should be clear to you that if I want to come up with the ith coefficient, I just need to take the projector of f on chi i. That is this way. This is the Fourier coefficient. This is not doing much at this point. We are just describing a basis change. But you know that Fourier transform is special. The basis also satisfies this property. And that is, why, that is why it is important to have this basis change, this specific basis change. There are many, many applications to it in computer science. You have property testing, you have quantum computing, you have error correcting code, so on and so forth. We will stick to learning Fourier transform now. And let me tell you or let me give you some intuition of how Fourier transform is useful. It turns out that there are many properties which are easily visible in the Fourier basis. In the point basis, it might take too much time to compute them, but in Fourier basis, they are easy. Actually, one of the simple ones is just f hat 1. This is the projection on the character basis. This is f, I will for the lack of notation, we will just call it chi trivial. Remember what was chi trivial? It was assigning 1 to every value. Then this inner product will become summation fx where x is all the elements of group elements. There might be a normalization con con constant. I will skip that. You can figure it out. But this shows that if I am interested in the summation of uh, all the function values, I can just get it by just by looking at f at one. If I was I had the vector in the normal in the standard basis, I will have to look at all n entries to calculate. On the other hand, in the Fourier basis, I can just look at one entry and find this value. This might remind you of something. This was the trick which we did in Toyshitsa. Actually, if you think about it, you can convince yourself that Deutsch Jotsa was a Fourier transform. We applied the Fourier transform on this function and it is actually not hard to see that the group involved was z2 to the power n. 
remember our function was minus 1 to the power of some complex numbers. Since this was the function, uh, the, the group involved was at the power n and then if we look at this as gx, we just did the Fourier transform on this, we were just interested in this quantity. Uh, where x is ranging from all the group elements. And then we looked at the trivial, uh, sorry, I should say Fourier coefficient corresponding to the trivial character. This is a very, very intuitive definition of Fourier transform. But then we should be able to do a Fourier transform on z2 to the power n. So our next question is going to be, what is the Fourier transform on this group? We said that if we have the Fourier transform on z2 to the power n, we should be able to solve the issue of subproblem. But what is that? few exercises. First ask what are the characters of Z2? This is the smallest group or smallest non-trivial group. It has just two elements and it is easy to see that there are only two characters of this. One is the trivial character which we already know. This is chi 1. So let us say group element G is equal to 0, G equal to 1, all of them assigned to 1. The other character is also quite clear. We know that this element g equal to 1 has ordered 2, then the only possible value is minus 1. These are the only two characters. We can have we could have at most two characters, and these are the only two characters of Z2. If I normalize, they look like 1 over root 2, 1, 1, and 1 over root 2, 1 minus 1. This should remind you of something. If I put them together, they will look like this. This is the Hadamard matrix. Hadamard transform. And now there is a fact which I am not going to tell, but if I want to find the Fourier transform of Z to the power n, I just need to take the tensor product of these matrices. That means the Fourier transform of Z to the power n is h to the n. So, we showed that Fourier transform on this group, the one which we needed is just Hadamard to the power n. And this tells you why we used h tensor n in the h tensor. We wanted to collect all the amplitudes, we wanted to find the summation, we know that Fourier transform does it and in the case of z to the power n, Fourier transform is precisely the head.